check test. Good deal. Uh, well, thank you guys for uh, staying around. I, I always pray when David gets up and speaks that, that we have a crowd after he's done. And I'm grateful for your perseverance. We're going to get better. Um, tomorrow he does speak, but it's not very long. So if you'll come tomorrow, uh, he, he won't slow you down too much. Um, no, we, we love getting to travel and do. We enjoy being able uh, to, to really challenge Christians. You know, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot is um, ultimately in our culture, we're not, we're not trying to get the heathen to restore righteousness or godliness. We're trying to get Christians to restore righteousness and godliness. And this is where we have to be challenged. And one of the things that working for wall builders, if you're not real familiar with our ministry, we, we focus on America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on our spiritual, our moral, our religious, our constitutional heritage. And, and so what we're going to do for a little bit is we're going to jump in, we're going to talk about some history. And, and, I, and I know for most people, um, you know, David talked about words uh, can, can bring emotion. And most people, history is not an emotion of encouragement and inspiration as we talk about history. Um, but I want to I wanna potentially show you some things that we haven't thought about before. One of the things that, that we do talk a lot about is the Bible. And, and as you study the Bible, one of the things that you will see over and over and over again is the significance and value of history. In fact, if you guys remember in, in 2 Kings 22, there was a young king who came to the throne, King Josiah, eight years old when he takes the throne. And, and in chapter 22, it's when he is now in, in like the 16th year of his reign. And he goes into the temple and they find these really old scrolls. And they get out the scrolls and he reads the scrolls and, and, and ultimately what he was reading, it was, most scholars believe it was the scroll of Deuteronomy, which was the history of Israel. And he read the history, and as he read the history, and as the history is being read, he's realizing, wait a second, this is who God called us to be? This, this is what we were supposed to be? We had no idea. And through reading their history, a national revival broke out because they realized that they were not doing what God had called or created them to do. And this was one of the things that you see, just through history. In fact, you jump forward to the book of Esther. And if you guys remember Esther, it was when there's King Xerxes. And one night, King Xerxes can't sleep. And so he gets the history book out. And he says, all right, I, I want to read the history of my kingdom. And as he reads the history of his kingdom, he finds out about Mordecai, who turned in these two guys that were going to kill him. And he says, you know what? I want to do something to honor Mordecai. So he calls and he brings Haman to him. And he says, Haman, okay, there's this guy that who's just been incredible in my kingdom and I love him. And Haman, in his pride and arrogance, thinks, well, he's talking about me. And the king says, what should I do to honor this guy? And Haman says, you should crown this guy in, in, in your apparel. He should be on your horse and paraded. And you should have your number one guy leading around saying, this is what the king does. And, and so the king says, great, I want you to go and do that for Mordecai. And you guys remember the frustration. And, and then, so finally, and, and we know the end of the story where Haman has his gallows and he's hung on the gallows. What's amazing though, is this whole sequence happened because the king went back and read history. He read history and realized there was something we should do and we haven't done it. History. You go to the New Testament. You remember the, the book of Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is called, uh, he's initially chosen to be one of the ones that, that helps the poor in the church. But then as he's witnessing, as he's doing, well, he gets called before the Sanhedrin because he's preaching in the name of Jesus. And when he goes before the Sanhedrin, you guys remember what he did for like a chapter and a half? He gave a history lesson. And that was, that's exactly what he did. He just told history. It's amazing as you start reading the Bible to see the emphasis that the Bible and God placed on history. And in fact, there's a phrase that you'll see a lot. Remember the former days or remember the works of the Lord. Remember what the Lord has done. This, this kind of thought appears over and over and over in Scripture. You know, God wants us to remember who he is and what he has done. You know what's interesting? If you follow the story of the Israelites, when did the Israelites get in trouble? It was only every time they forgot who God was and what God had done for them. And then they got themselves in trouble. History helps us remember who God is and what God has done. And this is one of the things we think about history today, and we don't always think about it the same way we used to think about history. In fact, David mentioned Daniel Webster, really remarkable guy, was a, a political leader in America for literally decades. Uh, whether it was as a famous attorney or an orator, this guy was remarkable. But one of the things he talked about one time, he talked about history. And, and, and he gave a definition of what he thought history was. Now, I want you to think with me for a second. If we were asking the question to somebody, what is history? What answer would you come up with if someone asked you that question? What is history? Well, this is what Daniel Webster said. He said, history is God's providence in human affairs. 
History is God's story. That's what, it's his story. Now we've heard that before, but history, is you're just seeing what God's done throughout time, that's what history is. Well, you can look at other people. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin today considered one of the leading deists of the founding fathers. Benjamin Franklin said that the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. God governs the affairs of men. If you look at history, you see that God played a part in what happened. You see that God governs, God leads, God directs. George Bancroft, who was known as the father of American history. He wrote uh, literally uh, dozens of, of history books of America. The guy just wrote all kinds of stuff in history, but this is what he explained about history. He said, the fortunes of a nation are not under the control of blind destiny, but follow the steps by which a favoring providence calling our institutions into being has conducted the country to its present happiness and glory. He said, when you study history, what you see is how God has built and developed, and, and he's talking about America. This, you see how God shaped and built and did this nation of America. Well, even people like Charles Coffin. Charles Coffin was uh, a, a guy who, he was a political leader, but he wrote a, a series of textbooks in early education. And in early America, this was the, the early 1800s. In early America, you, you didn't go to college to be a teacher. You went to college and you learned a skill, you learned a trade. But if you were educated, then you could be a teacher. And so what he did, he wrote a series of, of textbooks we used in schools, in public schools, but because people weren't really trained how to be teachers, in the front of his textbook, he would give a little section explaining to teachers, this is how you need to teach. And this is what he put in the front of his history textbook, helping teachers know how to teach history. This is what he said. Notice that while oppressors have carried out their plans in history, there were other forces silently at work, which in the time undermined their plans as if a divine hand were directing the counter plan. Whoever peruses a story of liberty without recognizing this feature will fail to fully comprehend the meaning of history. There must be a meaning to history or else existence is an incomprehensible enigma. Why is it today that history is the most boring subject in school? Because we don't look at it from the right perspective. See, history should be the story of what God has done, how God has constructed, how God delivered, how God saved, how God judged. History should be God's story. But you think about the way we look at education today. Do we think about God and his providential works when we look at history? No. The way education is taught today is we can't talk about God. In fact, we don't really even want to include God. And the, the more we have removed God, the more we have failed at actually even educating our children. Our, our academic performance has fallen through the floor. We've plummeted. In fact, if you look at, at, at testing for high school seniors, when they graduate and leave high school, they, they have a, a series of questions and all different kind of college groups will test them to see what the future will look like. So we test these seniors because they're gonna be our future leaders. Here's what they discovered. If you look at something like constitutional knowledge, 40% of graduates thought the Constitutional Convention of 1787 produced the Emancipation Proclamation. Now that's what freed the slaves. Abraham Lincoln did in 1863. Almost half of our seniors don't know the difference between what freed the slaves and what birthed the nation. That's kind of a problem. Well, 60% couldn't name even one of the 19 cabinet level departments. Department of Defense, Department of Justice, Department of Education, Department of Transportation. 19 kids had no idea what any of them were. In fact, only 15% could name the freedoms protected in the First Amendment. There's a reason people think there's a separation of church and state because they don't even know what the First Amendment says. We don't know very much anymore, and this is what we're seeing statistically from our high school seniors. 62% could not identify the three branches of government. There's only three. Executive, legislative, judicial. It's not real hard. But do you know that 66% of Americans that voted in the 2012 election and exit polling, 66% of Americans polled could not identify the three branches of government. That means the people that elect our officials don't even know what government is or how it operates. There's a problem when we start looking at what we do in education. In fact, even take something like geography. This is a little more embarrassing. 67% of graduates could not find Iraq on a map. 88% of graduates couldn't find Afghanistan on a map. Why does that really matter? Because we've been sending our brothers and our sisters, our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, our parents to war for over a dozen years and we have no idea where they've gone and fought and bled and died for us. We have no idea where they've, you're talking about the majority of high school students have no idea where this is going on. After Hurricane Katrina, one third of graduates could not find Louisiana on a map. That's embarrassing. 
don't know where Louisiana is. 75% of seniors couldn't find Israel on a map of the Middle East. Here's why this really matters. Israel, there, there's, by the way, there's always conflict, seems like, going on. Hamas right now with, with what's going on in Israel. But you know, there's, there's also these arguments of the Palestinian state. And all this stuff that happens around Israel, the problem is if you don't know where Israel is, you don't recognize how small Israel is. Israel is made up of only 13 million people. And they are surrounded by 14 Muslim nations. Now, by the way, when people argue about the, the state of Palestine, and we want, well, Israel should give their land up to have a Palestinian state, which, by the way, they have offered to give up half their land on multiple occasions, and the Palestinians don't want some of the land. They want all the land because they don't like Jews because they're Muslims. And by the way, those 14 Muslim nations have vowed they want to see Israel wiped off the face of the planet. Well, why does that matter? Because in those 14 Muslim nations, there's 1.9 billion people. So the Israelis are outnumbered 146 to 1. But our kids who are forming an opinion have no idea of what the facts are. We don't know the truth anymore. Our, our kids, their education is so poor right now. In fact, let's go back to geography. More than one half could not find either New York, Mississippi, or Ohio on a map of the United States. Could not identify those states. 39% of seniors in Baltimore could not find the United States on a world map. Now, I will tell you proudly, I'm from Texas. And most Texans are very proud to be from Texas, as you just saw. We are proud of Texas. This is something that embarrasses me, because this one came from seniors in Texas. 25% of seniors in Dallas could not identify the country that borders the United States in the South. No hablo español. No sé. No sé. You've got to be kidding me. See, the problem is, as, as, as we look at education, it, it's not just that our kids don't know very much anymore, that there's a, a more significant point, something that, that Ronald Reagan, I think, pointed out very well. Ronald Reagan explained that if we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. An eradication of the American memory could result in an erosion of the American spirit. Right now, we have a culture that has no idea who we are or what we're supposed to be. And largely, it's because we don't know who we used to be. We have an identity crisis because we've forgotten our history. And by the way, most people know very little about history, but one thing that's a very common theme we hear, if, if, if I put up this picture, this is a signing of the Declaration. What most people have been told about the signers is that they were atheists, agnostics, and deists. They were racists, they were bigots, and they were slaveholders. All of those claims are made on multiple occasions. The problem is we don't know history very well, and so we don't recognize how false those claims are. If you just go back in history, do you know the very first time Congress ever assembled was September 6, 1774. You know when Congress opened, this was a picture that was commissioned to represent what happened that first day because when Congress assembled the very first time, you, and by the way, you actually can go back and read the original records of Congress. One of the things in our Constitution, Article 1, Section 5, Paragraph 3, it mandates that everything that happens in Congress is written down. So if you want some really riveting reading, you can go read what they said in Congress. It'll put you to sleep real quick. But they have records from the very first day. Do you know the records of Congress showed that when they opened Congress, they actually opened with prayer. But it wasn't a prayer like we might imagine, like, Lord, bless our time together, anoint us, be with us, Amen. Their prayer lasted for two hours. Now, I can tell you, as someone who's been a pastor on staff for 10 years, I can barely get people that go to church to pray for two hours. You're talking about the political leaders of the nation who took two hours to pray. And by the way, after their two-hour prayer meeting, John Adams said they did something else. He explained they took the next two hours and they spent the next two hours in Bible study. They read four passages of Scripture and they went through and dissected what does God want to speak to us from these four chapters. One of the things they read was Psalm 35. And he was so impressed by what God spoke to them from Psalm 35, he wrote his wife Abigail a letter. And this is what he told his wife Abigail. He says, Abigail, I must beg you to read that Psalm. Read the 35th Psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. Her father was the Reverend William Smith, the pastor of their home church. John Adams says, babe, you got to read what we read. It's so inspired and encouraged us. He explained to her that we have hope for the very first time that if we have to go to war with Great Britain, we might actually be able to win because God will be on our side. You got to read this. Everybody, you need your, your, your father, the church, everybody needs to read this. But he went on and explained what else they did. Not only did they read the Bible, he says, we have appointed a continental fast. This is Congress calling the nation to prayer and fasting. 
And this is what he explained. He says, Abigail, if this, if this really happens, can you imagine what it'll look like? He said, millions would be upon their knees at once before their great creator, imploring his forgiveness and blessings, his smile on American counsel and arms. Abigail, can you imagine how incredible? If we can get, he says there's millions. There were only three million colonists at the time. So apparently John Adams thinks everybody's gonna join in this fasting and they're gonna pray and they're gonna do this is rather remarkable because if you just think about how, how we have started our nation with Congress, they opened with prayer, they had a Bible study, and they called for a national fast. That would be pretty impressive for a group of atheists, agnostics, and deists. I don't know many atheists that start their meetings this way. The problem is we don't know very much history anymore. And by the way, this was the very first call to prayer we had in the nation, but this was not unusual. If you look just prior to 1815, there were over 1,400 official government calls to prayer. 1,400 times the government called the nation to pray prior to 1815. Now let me ask you this. The notion that our founding fathers were atheists, agnostics, and deists, let's just be honest. Would an atheist call the nation to pray 1,400 times? No, there's no God, why would you pray? Would an agnostic, an agnostic is someone who says, well, you really can't know if there's a God or not. Why would you pray 1,400 times to a God you don't know if exists? And a deist is someone who believes there is a God, but he doesn't get involved in human affairs. Then why would you pray to him? The problem is you just have some basic logic and you know some basic history and you realize what we're told today is not true. But if you don't know the truth, you don't know you've been lied to. This is John 8, 32. You know the truth and it makes you free. You gotta know the truth. You know, just during the revolution, there were 12 calls, or excuse me, 15 calls to prayer just during the revolution. And actually you can find these in the records of Congress. And if you ever have a chance to look at them, what you'll see is there were two different kinds of prayer proclamation. The first one was for prayer, humiliation, and fasting. And the reason they explained is if we wanna see God move, we, we gotta let God know we're serious. We, we, we gotta humble ourselves, we gotta fast, we gotta seek his face. And they would do that. They'd have a prayer and fasting proclamation. Well, then if you check the records, go five or six months later, you'll find a second kind of prayer proclamation. And it was for prayer and thanksgiving. And the reason they explained was we prayed and asked God to move on our behalf. And God moved on our behalf. Now we need to go back and thank God for what God has done. So if God moves, we've got to thank him. Well, then they need to see God move again. So they have prayer and fasting. God moves. Well, let's thank God for what he's done. Prayer and thanksgiving. Fifteen times back and forth just during the course of the revolution. Well, the very first call to prayer was for prayer, humiliation, and fasting. And, and it wasn't long after this call to prayer, John Adams actually wrote his wife, Abigail, another letter. And he explained they were already seeing incredible things happen. He, he explained to his wife, he says, we, we have just captured, Colonel Smith and his men just captured a British fort. Now, if we read that today, that might not be real impressive. Except if you remember historical context, it becomes amazing. Great Britain was the number one military power in the world at the time. America didn't have a military because we used to be British citizens, so the British was our military. So we then have a bunch of farmers. Colonel Smith, by the way, Colonel Smith was, uh, he was considered a colonel at that time in the militia. But this is before we really had a military in America. And when the military first started in America, ranking is very different than it is today. I have two brothers in the military. And, and they're both officers and they both worked very hard and many years of doing and working to get to the place where they are. I understand there's a lot of work, there's a lot of training, a lot of classes that go into being an officer today. That wasn't the way it was back then. The way it was in early America was if you could get enough people to come and follow you, you could recruit your people and if they would come and follow you, you could be their leader, their officer. And the more people that would submit under you, the higher ranking officer you could become. So if you got enough people that wanted to follow you, you could be an officer. Well, Colonel Smith, he actually was a farmer who recruited the other farmers. He recruited the school teacher and the shopkeeper and the blacksmith. He recruited all the people from the town. He says, guys, we can't put up with this. We need to go against the British. And they went against the number one military power in the world and they took a fort from him. So John Adams says, Abigail, this is amazing. He went on and explained that we've just captured a 64 gun British man of worship and a 20 gun British man of worship. Now that was even more impressive because we didn't have a Navy yet. Now how you are able to capture ships without a Navy? Maybe you got really fast swimmers, I don't know. This is rather remarkable. Well, if you ever have a chance to go to Washington DC, uh, uh, they have the, the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Up on the third floor, they have one of the very first ships of our American Navy. It's called the Gunboat Philadelphia. This is the Gunboat Philadelphia. Now, that kind of looks to me like a rowboat with a cannon sticking out on either side. I'm not sure how much we intimidated the British as we're rowing toward them. 
We're capturing ships with a rowboat. How in the world? We have farmers that are taking on the, the most powerful military in the world, and we're taking their fort. How is this happening? Well, that was the question asked to John Adams. How in the world have we done? How, how, how do we accomplish this? This was John Adams' explanation. He said, it appears to me the eternal Son of God is operating powerfully against the British nation. Translation, it's only because of Jesus. Because there ain't no way this makes sense. But I want you to understand something about his answer. This wasn't a guy who said, you know what, we don't want God to be a part of what we do. This was a guy who understood, without God's help, we will never succeed in what it is we're trying to do. We can only do it if God helped. This is what we understood. See, these weren't people that didn't want God to be a part. They were people that knew without God's help, we'll never achieve it. Well, as, as you go forward, in 1778, General George Washington wrote one of his, his generals, General Thomas Nelson, a letter. And General Washington, by the way, he served in the U.S. military for 40 years. So this guy really knew about military. He knew about engagements in battle. He knew what it was to be in battle. And there are numerous accounts of where God divinely, supernaturally, providentially protected him where there were occasions where he was in the middle of a firefight and he left the firefight, bullet holes through his jacket, bullet holes through his hat, horses shot out from under him, not a mark on his body. He wrote his brother a letter and he told his brother that he went home and combed his hair and bullet fragments fell out of his hair, not a scratch on his head. I mean, this guy, he was protected in an amazing way from God. Well, he wrote one of his general Thomas Nelson's about God protecting us and helping us in battle. Here's what he told his general. He says, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. Now, let me break that down for you. Washington said, what God is doing has been so obvious that you must be worse than a non-believer and more than wicked if you can't acknowledge that God's been helping us in what we've been doing. God's hand was so apparent in what we were doing. Well, why in the world are you looking for God's hand? Because they knew without God's help, we'd never succeed. They'd been praying and asking God for help. They're thanking God when he did help. These weren't guys that didn't want God to be a part. Well, if you jump forward, 1783, this is when we signed the Peace Treaty of Paris. This is what officially ended the American Revolution. It's what brought peace between us and Great Britain and established America as a free and independent nation. This is still on display in Washington, D.C. It's in the state drawing room up on the sixth floor. It's called the John Quincy Adams State Drawing Room up in the State Department. On the left, you'll see 10 articles. Up here, David Hartley, he was a British ambassador. Then John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay. Those were the three American delegates. What's so significant about this document is notice the title of this document. It says, in the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity. Wait a second. The document that ended the American Revolution, brought peace between us and Great Britain, established America as a free and independent nation, came in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why in the world do we not learn about that in history today? Well, God doesn't have a part in history. Well, we can't talk about God in history. You know, it's interesting. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord all your heart, lean on your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. You know, I think if you put him at the top of the document, that's kind of in all your ways acknowledging him. That's pretty impressive. The problem is we don't know very much history anymore. In fact, even after the revolution, John Adams, several years after the revolution, he was approached and he was asked, how did you guys really pull that off? Because you had a bunch of ragtag nobodies, you had farmers. How in the world did you guys actually do this thing? This is what John Adams explained. He said the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. His explanation was it was only because we did it God's way. It was only because we, we did it based on the Bible and, and based on biblical teachings. And this is a little different than what we hear today. In fact, if you look at news reports or, or, or articles that come out, here's an article that ran in the LA Times. America's unchristian beginnings. The founding fathers were deists who rejected the divinity of Jesus. Here's one that ran in the East Coast. The authors of the Declaration were enemies of Christ. Here's one done by a college professor. The founding fathers were not Christians. And this is what we hear time and time and time again. Well, David and I have a, a, a fun opportunity. We get to, we get to do a, a lot of, uh, of high schools, and we get to speak to a lot of kids. And one of my favorite things to do is, is I'll bring up a group of kids, and I'll pull out some gift cards, and I'll say, okay, I got gift cards. And one of the questions I'll ask them is, if you can name five people in this picture that signed the declaration, 
you can have this $10 Chick-fil-A or Sonic or whatever gift card. This, this gift card is yours. And so these kids get excited. And okay, okay. You know, the very first person they find is Thomas Jefferson right here. The second person they find is Benjamin Franklin. You know what's amazing? I've never had any kid find anybody else. Interesting. And I go, guys, wait a second, wait a second. There, there's 56 signers. You got to know more than that. And I say, well, let's just, let's just, let, let me just take you around the room. Have you guys heard of Richard Henry Lee? We've never heard of him. Okay. Have you guys heard of George Clinton? We've never heard of him. Okay. Have you guys heard of Sam Adams? You know, there's only one thing kids seem to know about Sam Adams. Right? He's got a beer. The problem is, you guys know the Sam Adams beer is not like the Sam Adams beer. You actually can read the, the, the website on the, the Sam Adams Brewing Company, and the guy who started Sam Adams Beer in the 1980s, he said he was so impressed with Sam Adams as a founding father, he wanted to do something to honor him, so he named his beer after Sam Adams. Oh, I thought it was his beer. No, <laughs> no, it wasn't his beer. We know so little history. Now, the reason that's ridiculous, Sam Adams is considered the father of the American Revolution. The Boston Tea Party, that's because of him. That was done by the Sons of Liberty, and he led the Sons of Liberty. Committees of Correspondence, done by him. This guy was amazing. We don't know anything about him, and the thing we think we know isn't even accurate. So I tell the kids, no, that's not really right. Let's keep moving. Okay, have you guys heard of Charles Carroll? They've never heard of Charles Carroll. Okay, what about Robert Morris? Or what about Dr. Benjamin Rush? Or what about Elbridge Jerry? Or, or Robert Treat Payne? And you know, I can go around the rest of the room, and for the most part, they've never heard of any of those names. And I go, now wait a second, guys we've all heard that they're atheists, agnostics, and deists. But the only two guys you could identify are the two guys that everybody acknowledges were the least religious founding fathers. Well, maybe then there's a reason that you think they were atheists, agnostics, and deists because you only know the guys who were the least religious of them. The problem is we don't know about the rest of them. You know the 56 guys that signed the declaration, 29 of them graduated from what today would be considered Bible schools or seminaries? Over half of them went to schools where they were trained in biblical study. I don't know of many atheists that go to Bible college. Many deists that go to seminary. I'm not, I'm not familiar with them doing that. We know so little history today. And, and so what I want to do is just reintroduce you to people you might not know much about. John Witherspoon's a great example. John Witherspoon, he was an evangelist. He was a pastor, but he was one of the leading evangelists of the time. He was a, not only a signer of the Declaration, but he served in the state legislature of New Jersey. One of the cool things he did for New Jersey this is an actual Bible that was printed by John Witherspoon for his state of New Jersey. He printed a Bible on two different occasions because he wanted everybody in the state to have their own copy of the Bible. And he found out there were people in the state that didn't have a Bible, so he printed a Bible just so that everybody in his state could have their own copy of the Bible. Now that was done by a pastor, by an evangelist, and by the way, he wrote num numerous theological works. He has over a dozen volumes of his sermons why have we never heard of John Witherspoon? Well, you know what's interesting is he spoke during, during the revolution. He spoke in Congress more than almost anybody else. I think he was the second most. You know, it's not very hard to find him talking. And he talked about his faith an awful lot. This is one of the things he said about his faith. He said, I entreat you in the most earnest manner to believe in Jesus Christ, for there is no salvation in any other. If you are not reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, if you are not clothed with a spotless robe of his righteousness, you must forever perish. Now, I could be wrong, but that sounds pretty Christian to me. I, I don't know many heathen that talk like that. The problem is we've never heard of John Witherspoon. Or you can look at somebody else like Dr. Benjamin Rush. Dr. Benjamin Rush, a really an amazing guy. Dr. Benjamin Rush, uh, when he died in 1813, John Adams said he was one of the three most notable founding fathers. John Adams says George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and Dr. Benjamin Rush were the three most notable founding fathers. Today, we've never heard of Dr. Benjamin Rush, which is only a reflection of how little we know about history, because back then he was a rock star. This guy served on three different presidential administrations. He was considered the most famous doctor in American history. He came up with medical cures over 200 years ago that we are still using today. He started the first medical training in America. He actually is considered the father of public schools under the Constitution. He started five universities. Three of them are still going today. He started the very first academic education for women. He started the first academic education for African Americans. He's the one that actually started the very first faith-based prison reform where he said it's not enough to send guys to prison because if we're not teaching them about God, 
God and how to be godly, then we're just releasing heathen back on the street and we've done no good. We need to get them saved so they're not going to be the same when he started the faith-based prison reform. He also, by the way, started the Sunday school movement in America. So if you've ever been to Sunday school, he's the reason we have that in America. He started one of the very first Bible societies in America. And actually, we have that Bible society's original constitution, which he helped write. And in the constitution, he said there's two reasons why we think everybody in America needs the Bible. He says, number one, if everybody in America had their own copy of the Bible and they would read it, number one, they would get saved. So the first goal is we want people to get saved. But he said the second thing is if people had their own copy of the Bible and if they would read it and, and, and if they would then learn to live by it, it would solve every social injustice in our world today. There would be no more crime, no more slavery, no more oppression, no more murder. Every problem we have could be solved if people would just follow the Word of God. So he started a Bible society, which by the way, he also came up with one of the very first ways to do a, a hot press Bible. So printing could be done f faster and quicker. They could have more Bibles out. This guy was amazing. This guy was so remarkable. He had over a hundred volumes of writings. This guy wrote everything down. He used to be one of the most famous guys today. We've never heard of him. But you know, in all his writings, you can't go through a single one of his writings where he doesn't talk about his faith. This is what he said about his faith. My only hope of salvation is in the infinite, transcendent love of God manifested to the world by the death of his son upon the cross. Nothing but his blood will wash away my sins. I rely exclusively upon it. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. It's hard to confuse that. That's pretty blatant in what that is. And by the way, just to kind of point out, this very last thing, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, that seems kind of religious. Well, actually, it's biblical. It's the very last verse of the Bible where John ends Revelation and he says, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. See, one of the problems we have when we look at history is not only do we not know very much history, we also don't realize how religious the founding fathers were because we don't know the Bible well enough to recognize when they're even quoting the Bible. We know so little of the Bible and so little of history and this is why our nation's in the trouble we're in today. But there's other examples. People like Francis Hopkinson is a great example. Francis Hopkinson, he was the guy that designed the first American flag. He designed a number of government seals. He was U.S. Treasurer during the Revolution. What was cool about Francis Hopkinson, though, is at his home church, he was the music minister and choir director at his home church. And he came up with the very first purely American hymn book. Now, what this hymn book is, is he took the 150 psalms and he put the 150 psalms to music so that his church could sing the psalms just like David had sung the psalms. First hymn book done that was a purely American hymn book. This is pretty remarkable. Now, by the way, that is a, an, an impressive feat. If, if you have any musical inclination, you just try when you go home, put the 150 psalms to music. That's not easy. And by the way, if that's a little too daunting, just try putting Psalm 119 to music. And if you got Psalm 119 to music, how many church services would it take you to sing Psalm 119? It's 32 pages in the hymn book. Can you imagine? Let's sing it again. No! Oh my gosh! This is a founding father who, by the way, his faith is very easy to identify. The problem is we've never heard of Francis Hopkinson. We've never heard of that guy. Well, let me give you somebody you have heard of, John Hancock. John Hancock, who was the president of Congress during the Revolution, we recognize because he has a massive signature. Well, do you know John Hancock as the first governor of Massachusetts? Do you know what he did as governor? He actually called his state to pray. This is one of his original prayer proclamations. And by the way, as I'm showing you stuff, we've been very blessed at Wall Builders. We have over 100,000 original documents from the Founding Fathers that predate 1812. So as I'm telling you stuff, this isn't stuff that we're just guessing they did. We have the actual documents. This is one of the original proclamations from John Hancock that we own. Very cool thing. At the very end of this uh, proclamation, one of the things that John Hancock says, he says, we also need to pray that if there is anybody in our state that does not have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I think that's called the salvation message. That, that if they're not saved, that they would get saved. John Hancock, one of the people of a state to be saved, you know what? He had 22 different calls to prayer, and he ended almost every one of his proclamations with the call saying, if someone doesn't know Jesus, we need to pray they come to know Jesus. That's rather impressive from John Hancock. We only knew he had a famous signature. We had no idea he was a Christian. 
or how easy it was to see his faith. See, we just don't know very much history anymore. Or another great example is Sam Adams, because Sam Adams is the name that most people recognize today. We just don't know very much about Sam Adams. But Sam Adams was the second governor of Massachusetts. He was lieutenant governor under John Hancock, but he was the next governor. This is one of his original prayer proclamations. You see it says for fasting, humiliation, and prayer. Well, Sam Adams had seven different prayer proclamations, and he was only governor for about three and a half years. He got sick in office, had to leave office because of sickness, ended up dying because of that sickness. But in three and a half years, he had seven calls to prayer. That's about two a year. That's a pretty good average and ratio for a guy that today we only know how to beer is what we're told about him. You know what's interesting, though, is the founding fathers said about Sam Adams that he was one of the most outspoken Christians of all the group. And this is what Sam Adams explained very simply about his faith when he was asked. He said, I rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ for pardon of all my sins. It's real simple. I believe in Jesus, and I believe he's what I need in my life. That's, that's all I'm relying on is what Jesus has done. It's hard to confuse that, but when we've never heard that, we have no idea. And this is one of the problems when we see even the way we study history today, we don't go back and study any of these guys, and we used to. In fact, at Wall Builders, we've reprinted an old textbook, an 1848 textbook called Lives of the Signers. And what we used to do, this was in public schools for over 100 years. We would go through, and every year our, our high school students they would study about the signers of the Declaration. They knew who they were, they knew about their family, they knew about their accomplishments, and they knew about their faith. See, in previous generations, we never would have believed the Founding Fathers were atheists, agnostics, and deists because we actually knew who they were. Today, we don't know our history anymore. It's easy to believe a lie if you don't know the truth. But when you know the truth, it's hard to believe a lie because you know that's not right. This is what we used to do in history. Today, we don't know very much history anymore. Another book that was done in public schools is called The Wives of the Signers. Now, as much as, as we emphasize, we gotta know the founding fathers and who they were, let me tell you, their wives were unbelievable. Abigail Adams, let me give you a great example. John Adams, as he's going over to negotiate the Peace Treaty of Paris, he's gone for three years. That lady, controlled the entire house, controlled the property, controlled the kids, fought off the British for three years without her husband. That's amazing. That woman had some backbone. Elizabeth Lewis, another great example. Elizabeth Lewis, her husband was a signer of the Declaration, Francis Lewis. Well, when the 56 signers signed the Declaration, essentially they were signing a death warrant because when the king saw it, he says, okay, I'm gonna put all these guys to death. Well, when the British land, they come looking to execute those 56 guys because they're gonna make a public example that you cannot oppose the king and live. They go to the home of Francis Lewis. He is not there, but his wife Elizabeth is. The British come marching to the front door, and an officer commands everybody out of the house. He's going to burn the house to the ground. Elizabeth Lewis plants herself in the doorframe of the house. She says, I'm not leaving. The officer said, lady, get out of the house. We're burning it down. She says, I'm not leaving. The officer's getting a little frustrated. He says, lady, if you don't get out of the house, I'm going to command my troops. We're going to open fire on the house with you in it. She says, I don't care. I'm not leaving. The officer commanded his troops to open fire. One of the men fired a cannon. Cannonball went between her legs, blew out the boards on the boardwalk where she was standing. One of the servants came running over and said, man, we gotta go, we gotta go. She says, no, I'm fine. I'm gonna stay here. They can't hit the same place twice. I'll be fine. Hold up. I don't know what she was doing that day that gave her such courage. Heck no. I'm done. All right, you got the place. I'm out. This lady was not about to back down. Because of her defiance, the British officer took her, threw her in prison. Actually in prison, because of her defiance, they neglected to even give her bread and water most meals of the day. She became so sick, so dehydrated, so malnourished in prison, other prisoners tried to sneak her their bread and water just to keep her alive. George Washington found out what was going on. He worked out a prisoner of war exchange to get her released. When she was finally released, she was so sick that she died very shortly after her release because of the abuse and mistreatment she received. Now, let me just point this out. We have a culture where we struggle for our kids to find heroes and heroines to look up to. And I'm telling you, we got some pretty amazing examples of courage and integrity and character and honor that our kids could have great examples to look to. The problem is we've never heard of them before. This is one of the problems with not knowing our history. We don't know who we are and where we're going. Well, let me give you one last example. Charles Carroll's a great example. Charles Carroll lived to be the last surviving signer of the Declaration. He lived to be 95 years old. And 95 years old is, is really old for us today, but that was really old back then. The average lifespan during the Revolution was only about 34, 35 years old. So living to be 95 years old, he outlived his kids, he outlived his grandkids. 
He's outliving some of his great grandkids. One day he got a letter from one of his family members. He was 92 years old. And, and, and they said, Mr. Carroll, you've lived a very long life. But, but you do understand one day you are going to die. And when you die, are you ready to stand before God in judgment? Well, that's a good question. Are you ready to meet God when you die? This is the letter he wrote back as a response. And in this letter, he says, absolutely, I'm ready to meet God when I die. And this was his explanation. I'm going to start with my arrow as it says, on the mercy. This was his explanation to why I am ready to meet God when I die. This is what he said. He said, on the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation and on his merits, not on the works I have done in obedience to his precepts. Now, that sounds a lot like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourself is a gift of God. It's not of works so no one can boast. That's what he explains. This is why I'm ready to stand before God because I'm not relying on mine. I'm relying on his. That's a pretty good answer. Well, living to be the last surviving signer, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration, 4th of July, 1826, there were three signers of the Declaration left alive. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Charles Carroll. Well, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on the 50th anniversary. So Charles Carroll is now the last surviving signer. Well, the state of New York had an original copy of the Declaration. It looked just like this. And they wrote and they said, will you please, as a last surviving signer, come to New York. Would you write an inscription on our Declaration so everybody can see the last signer, what he said, what you do. Would you come and do this? So he said, yes. He wrote up to New York and he wrote an inscription on their Declaration. They put it on display at New York City Hall. This is what he wrote. He said, I am grateful to Almighty God for the blessings which through Jesus Christ our Lord he has conferred on my beloved country. And they put it on display at New York City Hall. He says, I'm so grateful to God through Jesus for what he's done for America. That, that just doesn't sound to me like someone who's an enemy of Christ. That's what we're told today. Now, why in the world do we hear these messages today? Well, largely because that's what's taught in universities today. That's what most people hear. In fact, one of the books that's used in universities today is this book right here called The Godless Constitution. This was done by two professors at Cornell University, Kramnik and Moore. And the notion of this is that our government was intended to be godless. The founding fathers, the majority of them were atheists, agnostics, and deists. They didn't believe in God. They didn't want God. And nobody wanted God to be a part of our government. This is the premise of their book. Now, the problem with this is that's an awful lot of claims that you're gonna to need to substantiate with some evidence and some proof. Now, by the way, just so you know, when you look at the guys that gave us the Constitution, there were 55 original writers and members of the Constitution. Of those 55 guys, 26 were Episcopalian, 11 were Presbyterian, seven were Congregationalists, two were Lutheran, two were Dutch Reformed, two were Methodist, two were Quakers, two were Roman Catholic, and there was Benjamin Franklin. By the way, he attended multiple churches. We'll talk about his faith a little bit more tomorrow because he was a pretty impressive guy. But that's who they're saying these guys did not want God to be a part of our nation. Well, anytime someone makes a claim, I always like to know, well, where did you get your information? What original sources do you have to substantiate that? Because anybody can have an opinion, but you got to have facts. So if you go to the back of this book, the back of the book, there is a note on sources. This is where they show you where they got their information from. Here's what they said about their, their notes. They said, we have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. Oh, so you have no proof. This is taught in universities today. Kids are learning this. There is no proof. There is no evidence. In fact, all of the facts point to the direct opposite of what they're being told but they're told, hey, I'm a professor, I'm a PhD, you can believe what I say because I've got this fancy title in front of my name. The problem is, as Christians, we forgot to be like Acts 17 Bereans, where if you guys remember, Paul went to the Bereans and Paul started speaking to the Bereans and Paul was explaining to them about Jesus and he was talking about the Old Testament, how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy and he starts explaining the prophecy and he says, if you look in Isaiah, and they said, stop. And they went and looked in Isaiah. They said, okay, continue. And he says, in fact, in Joel, and they said, stop. They got the scroll of Joel, and they looked at Joel. And Paul says, you guys are my favorite people to talk to ever, because no one will ever mislead you, because you always make sure what you know is true. And this is one of the problems, especially in Christianity today. See, David talked about, are, are, are we living based on feelings or principles? Really, we could say opinions or facts, because everybody has feelings, everybody has opinions. It doesn't mean it's true. We want to know as Christians what is true. Because truth, it doesn't matter how I feel or what I want and what my desires and what my feelings are. 
what's true. That's where as Christians we ought to be lining up. And this is where we just largely have lost in America today. We don't investigate what's true. You know what's interesting is if you look at, at throughout American history, there's over 300 court decisions where the, the court, U.S. Supreme Court explained, you know America is a Christian nation? In fact, one of the most famous came in 1892. It was a unanimous decision. Uh, it was a 16-page decision and eight pages of that decision and eight of those 16 pages, it gave over 84 reasons why the U.S. Supreme Court said America is a Christian nation. Well, that decision was delivered by Justice David Brewer. And after delivering that decision, Justice Brewer received a lot of questions from people saying, okay, explain to us why you're saying America's, because you have 84 reasons, but explain it to us. So he wrote a book and he wrote a book explaining why they said America was a Christian nation. And this is what he said about America being a Christian nation. Just as David Brewer explained, we constantly speak of this republic as a Christian nation. In fact, as a leading Christian nation of the world. In what sense can it be called a Christian nation? Now, this is one of the arguments today. Well, America is not a Christian nation. It depends on what you mean by Christian nation. Because that's like today saying, well, I'm a Christian. It depends on what you mean by Christian. Because I would say if you're not biblical, it's going to be hard to be a Christian. Because Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. And so if you're not obeying what God commanded, I, I don't really, I, I don't know if I can, obviously God judges the hearts, but I judge the fruit. And if I, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is just kind of silly. So if, if, if we're going to talk about Christian nation, how do we define Christian nation? Well, this is what he explained. He said, not in the sense that Christianity is the established religion or the people are in any manner compelled to support it. It's, we don't say America's a Christian nation because you have to be a Christian in America. That's not why we say it. Neither is it Christian in the sense that all its citizens are either in fact or name Christians. We don't say we're a Christian nation because 100% of the people in America are Christians. Do you know we had the first Muslim come to America in 1619 that we know of? Uh, the, the, actually, there was a Jewish synagogue that opened in 1654. There was a Hindu temple that opened in the late 1700s. We've always had people of different faiths in America. That's not why we say we're a Christian nation. This is what he explained. He says, on the contrary, all religions have free scope within our borders. Numbers of our people profess other religions, and many reject all. Nor is it Christian in the sense that a profession of Christianity is a condition of holding office or essential to recognition either politically or socially. It's not because if you're not a Christian, you're the outcast. That's not why we say we're a Christian nation. Nevertheless, we constantly speak of this republic as a Christian nation. In fact, as the leading Christian nation of the world. Now he's about to explain to us, why do we say America is a Christian nation? Why do we give you that explanation? This is what he explained. He says, America is most justly called a Christian nation because Christianity has so largely shaped and molded it. The reason we say we're a Christian nation is because the way we operate in America are according to the principles of Christianity. Now, most people fail to recognize that today, but that's something that used to be very well understood. In fact, President Teddy Roosevelt explained that very thing. He said, the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our civic and social life, it would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if those teachings were removed. Now, he says the Bible has so shaped the life that we live, but notice what he said. He says it shaped our civic and our social life. You know, he didn't say the Bible has shaped the spiritual life of America. He says the Bible has shaped our civic, our government, our politics, our education, and our social, our interaction, the way we do and how we... The Bible has so much shaped and formed what we do in America. He says, if you remove the Bible, you would not recognize America. And here's how I want to close tonight. I want to close by just giving you a few examples of things that we enjoy in America that we enjoy because of Christianity. And let me start with the first one. The first one is a Republican form of government. Do you know when, when we first came to America, when the pilgrims first came to America, do you know they established a Republican form of government? Now, this is a good question. Why would they establish a Republican form of government? Because it was not the era of the Republic. It was the era of the monarch. We came to America and did something nobody else was doing anywhere else. Why? Well, because before they ever left New Holland and England, their pastor, John Robinson, got on the boat with them. He opened the Bible and taught them the principle of Exodus 18, 21. Now, what he did is he backed up and said, look, God's idea was never for us to have kings. Remember when the Israelites wanted a king and God said, you don't want a king, it's a terrible idea. And they said, everybody else has one, we want one. And God said, through Samuel, you understand he's gonna tax you and take your sons, your daughters, your property, you're gonna lose everything, you don't want a king. And so what he did is said, now notice what God did before 
there was a king. He went back to Exodus 18, 21, where Moses was told, choose leaders from among you to represent the people. Leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. He taught them when you get there, you elect commoners as yourself. We don't set up different classes of people. We don't have lords and nobles. You, he taught them the Republican form of government based on what the Bible taught. Why do we have that in America? Because of what the Bible taught. That's where that came from. You look at something else like the rights of conscience. Do you know in America that we still enjoy the rights of conscience today? Even though there's been some issues where rights of conscience have been called into question, do you know Quakers have never and will never be required to fight in wars? Because it goes against their convictions. Do you know Seventh-day Adventists cannot be required to work on a Saturday? Same thing with Jews, because that's their Sabbath. You cannot, re- same thing with, with, with Jews and Muslims. They cannot be required to shave their beard at a other place or at a, a, a position where normally you'd have to be clean shaven at the position. We respect the rights of conscience. Why do we respect the rights of conscience? Where did we come up with this idea? Do you know 30 times in the New Testament alone, we are challenged with the rights of conscience? 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, James 4. It's all over the place. That came from the Bible. That's not a thought. Now, by the way, notice this was not the thinking of the day. This was contrary to what everybody else was doing. The kings weren't saying, oh, you're convicted differently. That's fine. Do what you're convicted to do. The king don't care how you're convicted. This was not what was going on in culture, but that's what the Bible taught. So we did something different in America than what was going on anywhere else. Here's another example. Free market approach to religion. Do you know in America, we've never had an established religion? In fact, we've always said you are free to believe in whatever you want to believe in without fear of persecution. And that still goes on today, with the possible exception if you're a Christian. Then you might be in trouble. Anybody else, you're fine. Why in the world did we say you can believe in whatever you want to believe in? Again, this was not what was going on around the rest of the world. There was national denominations where the king would pick a denomination. We said, in America, we're not doing that. Why? It's what the Bible teaches. You start in Genesis. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. You move on to Joshua. Joshua, as he's leading leading the Israelites into Canaan, he says, you need to choose going forward who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. God always gave the people a choice. What's interesting, one of the best examples, I think, is 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18 is where Elijah goes up on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And you guys remember, as this goes on, he's got the, the, the 450 prophets of Asher and 400 prophets of Baal. And so Elijah's feeling a man by himself, but he goes up and these 400 prophets are against him. And so he takes this ox and, and they take an ox and they build this altar. And remember, he drenched it with water and, and, and you know how it went down. And he says, okay, you guys, you take all the time you want. Y'all go first. You pray as long as you need to pray. And whichever God answers by fire, that's the real God. You know what, what's interesting about this? It's always kind of challenged and convicted me. You know, Elijah never discouraged the prayers of heathen. That's interesting to me. In fact, Elijah mockingly encourages them, if you remember the story. After a while, Elijah's like, oh, it's not working? Well, maybe you should cry louder, because maybe it's like vacation, bathroom. You don't know. You should be louder. Elijah was not intimidated by somebody else's prayer. What's interesting about this, I think biblically, the position Christians ought to have, I don't have any problem with Muslims praying in public school as long as Christians get to also. Because here was a notion. Elijah said, I don't, I'm not scared of your prayers. There's only one God that answers by fire. So you take all the time you want because your God ain't real and he ain't gonna answer you. I don't mind anybody else praying because their God's not real. I serve the one true living God, the only God that answers by fire. So you take all the time you want as long as I get my chance to pray. But see, God always gave people a choice. This is what we see. The reason we did that in America, that's what the Bible teaches. Look at something like inalienable rights and limited government. We, we laid this out in our declaration. It's ensured in our constitution. Why did we believe that God had given man rights and government's job was to protect what God had done? Because that's exactly what God laid out from the very beginning of creation all the way up when God established government. It didn't come until Genesis chapter eight when Noah lands the boat on Mount Ararat and God establishes the very first civil ordinance where God tells Noah, hey, when we just got rid of all the heathen and now we're starting over with you and your family, we're not gonna do what we used to do. What used to be acceptable, that's not what we're doing anymore. All that debauchery, all the drunkenness, all the sexual perversion, the murder, we're not doing, in fact, you know what, from now on, if anybody sheds blood, by man, his blood's gonna be shed. God upheld the highest standard for life because he says if anybody takes a life, you take their life. That's the highest penalty because that was the highest standard God could have given it. Well, that's when God established government. But when did God give rights to man? All the way back in the Garden of Eden. 
God gave man rights and government was established to protect what God had given. That's what the Bible teaches. That's where that thought came from. That's not man-made and man-derived. You look at something like public benevolence. Do you know in America we have what are called Good Samaritan Laws? We're the only nation of the world that has Good Samaritan Laws. We have them in all 50 states. In fact, they're called, as Good Samaritan Laws, uh, if, for example, when you're driving home tonight, if you see a car wreck and you decide you want to stop and help the person in the car wreck, and, and let's say something happens in the car, there's a fire, and you're trying to get this person out, and as you're getting them out, they die. Do you know you can't be held responsible for their death if you were trying to save their life? Because you were trying to be a good Samaritan. Now, we're the only nation in the world that has good Samaritan laws. All 50 states have good Samaritan laws. Let me ask you this question. Where did we come up with the concept of the good Samaritan? The Bible. Jesus taught a whole teaching on that. See, it's amazing when you start looking at what we have and where it came from, how much of it came directly from the Bible. Even something like a free market economic system. This is something that today gets slammed like crazy by college professors. We need to be socialists and communists and Marxists. That's ridiculous. But let me just back you up and show you a little history about this. The free market economic system, do you know when we first came to America, we actually tried socialism in America? In fact, the first two settlements were Jamestown and Plymouth uh, with Governor Smith and Governor Bradford. And let's just look at Plymouth. When you had Governor Bradford of Plymouth, when he first got there, they had 102 pilgrims. Well, the first winter comes and half of the pilgrims died. So now he has only half of what he started with. Well, the second winter comes and half of the remaining pilgrims die. He went from 102 to 50 down to about 24 people. And Governor Bradford starts going, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. You know what's interesting is he kept a very extensive journal. In his journal, he talked about the problems. He says, one of the reasons we are having such hardship is because we have a common storehouse system where everybody shares and shares alike. Because when he first got there, he was trying to do a smart thing. And he says, guys, we're going to have to work together or we're not going to make it. So everybody, you are going to work and do, but then we're going to share all the profit with everybody and we're going to share equally. Well, the problem was you only had a few young men and then you had old men and then you had children and you had the women who were doing there were only a few people that could do really hard work. And these guys are busting their tails doing hard work and they're coming back and then they're seeing all their labor going to everybody else and they're going, oh my gosh, I'm working so hard. And so Governor Bradford said the problem was they started faking sickness because they got tired of working hard and not being able to enjoy the benefits of their own hard work. So they started faking sickness. And he, he said what happened is, is they could not produce enough and so socialism was dying. Two years into it, they have 24 people left. And Governor Bradford says, you know, we're going to have to change the way we do things. He started reading his Bible. And he came upon the verse in 1 Timothy 5, 8, which says, if a man will not provide for his own family, he's worse than a non-believer. And Governor Bradford had an epiphany and said, wait a second. You mean God wants us to have individual responsibility? Now, obviously understand, we're talking about a sensitive issue. And I'm not talking about feelings. I'm talking about principles. Because the Bible is very clear. Widows, orphans, we want to take care of. We want to help and do. But if you are capable of working and instead you choose to let somebody else provide for you, that's not what God's called you to do. And he says, we're going to have to change the way we do things. So he started giving everybody a section of land. He delegated land and says, okay, you are now responsible for your land. If you can grow on your land and you can cultivate and you can develop, you can take what you have and you can enjoy and you can sell and you can eat and you can trade, but you're now responsible. You know, an amazing thing happened. They went from being almost extinct within a couple of years. They became the most productive per capita society in the entire English system. Because all of a sudden, everybody realized, you know, the harder I work, the more benefit I enjoy because I get to enjoy the benefit of my labor. This is an amazing thing. Well, this is what we used to understand. By the way, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 says, if a man would not work, he should not eat. And again, I'm not talking about handicapped people. We're not talking about people that physically need help. We're talking about physically capable of working and choose not to. That's not what God rewards. God has said, no, if you want to eat, you better do some work. Mom and dad, it's a great chore lesson. You want to eat? You better take out that trash. You better make up your bed. You better sweep. You better vacuum. You better do something. This was a simple principle we learned in early America. In fact, you know, the founding fathers, they talked pretty openly about this, but this is something you can, even can see in the Bible. Those are two examples I gave you from the Bible about individual responsibility, about working hard. But you know, Jesus taught more parables on money than any other topic. In Matthew 20, he taught a parable that labor gets rewarded. In Matthew 25, that skill gets rewarded. In, in Luke 19, that profit gets rewarded. Now, this is one that would be an epiphany for most people, especially our politicians today. You know what Jesus taught is, is 
is there was a parable where the master called all the servants to him and they each got a mina. And he says, okay, I'm leaving, but I'm gonna leave you in charge. I'm, I'm gonna go, but when I come back, I'm gonna call you to account to see what you've done. Well, if you remember the story from Luke 19, the first one comes and says, master, I made 10. Here's what you did. And the master says, Master says, well done, good and faithful. Second one says, Master, I made five. Well done, good and faithful. Third one says, Master, I, I was scared because I knew you, you reap what you haven't sowed, you gather what you haven't scattered, so, so, so I buried it. But here, I've brought back what's yours. Remember what the master said? You wicked, lazy, unprofitable servant. If, if you knew I was gonna demand from you, you should have at least invested it because you did nothing. Take from the one who was not productive and give to the one who has 10. And all the servants said, Master, he's already got 10. Socialism. And the master said, yeah, but to everyone who has, more will be given. To him who does not have, even what he has is taken away. Why would you want to punish the people that are being the best stewards of what they've been given? That doesn't make any sense. Now, I understand this is not a nice, feel-good thing because we have mercy and we have emotions and we want to help and do for people, absolutely. But Jesus, the principle Jesus always taught was not, I'm going to do everything for you. It's, I'm going to help you be an overcomer. I'm going to help you be a success. You become a doer. You become a haver. See, the principle was you don't reward the unproductive. But you know, in our society today, that's exactly what we do. Missouri, for example, you know, in Missouri, there's a family who receives $43,000 of government assistance and nobody in the family has a job. Nobody in the family is even looking for a job and they get $43,000 every year. Sign me up for that one. I'll take $43,000 for doing nothing. And that's exactly what people are thinking because we reward the unproductive and this is the problem that we are seeing happen. This is why Benjamin Franklin, he explained that a free market is the means under God. Now, why do we say under God? Because the free market is based on individual responsibility, which is what God teaches. He says the means of establishing the freedom of our country entire and handing it down complete to posterity. Thomas Jefferson said the pillars of our prosperity are the most thriving when left most free to individual enterprise. How, how can we enjoy the most productivity? He says, give people freedom. The more freedom they have, the more prosperous they are. Now, that's a notion today that's lost in government because government thinks the bigger they are, then the better it is for us. The problem is that's just never been true, not even one time. And let me give you a great example. If you look at the peninsula of Korea, after the Korean War, we're split into North and South Korea. South Korea has the exact same land, uh, heritage, natural resources, everything is the same. Even speak the same language as North Korea. The difference is in South Korea, they have a free market system, individual responsibility. In North Korea, it's a command economy. The government runs it. Well, do you know they have satellite imaging to see where there's electricity in those two nations? And here's what they've discovered. Remember, South Korea, the people run. It's, it's free market. North Korea, it's a command. It's a dictator who runs it. This is what they saw with electricity. It's not even close. Now, I will point out there is one dot up here, but I think that's where the dictator lives, so I don't know if we can really count that electric spot. Do you know since, since the Korean War, almost three million people have starved to death in North Korea. South Korea is in the top 10 nations in the world in the most productive economies. They have the exact same land, culture, heritage, natural resources. Everything is the same except the government. This is what we used to understand. See, the reason we did the free market is because the Bible teaches individual responsibility. Now, again, that doesn't mean we don't help people. We'll talk about that a lot more tomorrow and even Sunday about how the church has been called to get engaged and involved in the community. We're the ones to help people. But the bottom line is the Bible teaches individual responsibility. God expects us to be responsible and do something. And here's the last thing I'm going to show you. The last thing is an educated citizenry. Do you know the reason we started public schools in America? It actually goes all the way back to the, the, the early 1600s when we had the very first settlers and pilgrims coming to America. But as they came to America, they realized that one of the problems was we had a lot of people that were not educated. And they said if, if, if they don't know how to read and they can't read the Bible, and then they won't know what God has for them. And if they don't know what God has for them, then we're going to be in all kinds of trouble. So they passed a law to make sure every kid could read. But then what they did is they passed a law, or actually they printed the very first uh, education book in America. It's called the New England Primer. I have an original New England Primer. It's a very small little book. This was done in 1690, the very first one. This is a very small, it, it was considered the first grade textbook. The reason was it was the very first school book we ever used in America. Now, as you go through this book, it starts and it, it has the alphabet because we're teaching kids, obviously, how, how we're going to construct words and, and, and vowels and syllables, consonant. We're putting it all together. You know, the very first thing in this is an illustrated alphabet. When it comes to the alphabet, the very first one's an illustrated alphabet. Here is the illustrated alphabet. 
A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. That's a picture of a man and a woman by a fruit tree with a snake. B, heaven to mind, or heaven to find the Bible mind. It's a picture of a man. He's got a Bible in his hand. He's looking up to heaven. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. That's three wise men. That's a stable. That's a star by the stable. That's a cross on a hill. You know, that's kind of religious for just the alphabet. That's pretty remarkable. Well, you keep going. And the whole thing, by the way, is biblical. But go to H. H says, my book and heart must never part. That's a picture of a heart with a Bible inside of it. This is a public school textbook. This is the very first textbook we ever used in schools in America. You know, that, that picture reminds me a lot of Psalm 119. That word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee? That's what we're teaching kids. Well, if, if you go to the next alphabet in this book, it's called an alphabet of lessons for youth. Here's what it says. A, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. C, come unto Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. On it goes A through Z, and every one is a Bible verse. Why in the world are we using Bible verses to teach our kids the alphabet? Because that was the point of education. The reason we did school in America was to make sure our kids could read so they could read the Bible. So if we want them to know the Bible, we might as well put it right there in their book. And by the way, this being a first grade textbook, it didn't matter if you were four or five, seven, eight or 11, this was the book you started. First grade textbook. At the end of this first grade textbook, there was a series of catechisms of questions and answers, what we wanted kids to know. Notice what we used to ask first graders in public school. This question right here is a great example. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? I can tell you I went to Bible college and that's what I did in Bible college. A first grader in early America used to do that. Now, I will also point out, I did have the answer right below it to help them out. But let's just be honest. Why in the world would you ask a first grader that question? The only reason you do it is because you want them to have the knowledge of that answer. You want them to know what that... This is public school in America. This is the reason we did what we did. See, if, if you go back to what, oh, oh, by the way, let me point out, this is why Sam Adams actually reprinted the, the New England Primer for his state of Massachusetts when he was governor. This is why Noah Webster reprinted it for his state of Connecticut. Even Benjamin Franklin reprinted it for his state of Pennsylvania because they wanted their kids to know what this taught. And we've actually reprinted the one uh, that the founding fathers used, 1777, the one they reprinted. We actually reprinted that very, very cool book. But here's, here's what Teddy Roosevelt explained. He says, if you remove the Bible, you would not even recognize America because all that we enjoy is because of the Bible. Well, you know, if you look at what the Bible produced in America, if we didn't have the Bible and Christianity, we would not enjoy the nation we live in because so much of what we enjoy is a result of what the Bible teaches. This is what we used to understand. See, as David talked about the Bible as the answer, we used to know the Bible was the answer and we applied it to everything we did. We always went to the Bible, and this is where we have so confused in culture that even as Christians, we just don't know the Bible very well anymore, and it's hard to apply something you don't know. We got to get back and know the Bible. And I'm going to close with this challenge. First of all, based on the fact of, what, uh, of the way our nation operates, of what Christianity is produced in America, I would say we are a Christian nation. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean everything we do is Christian. We got a lot of problems, and we need the church to step up now more than ever in our nation. We got a lot of things that need to be fixed, but the bottom line is we still operate more according to Christian principles than anything else. And I'll go even a step further to explain that Christianity benefits our nation. Everything that we enjoy in this nation today, I would argue is a result of Christianity. Because without Christianity, you would not enjoy what that thing is that you enjoy. This is what Christianity, this is what God does for a nation. When you do it God's way, it only works every single time. It's what we used to understand. Well, you know, as you look at our nation today, our nation today is in a different place. Um, as we see tax on our liberty, on our religious freedoms, even the problems with the economy, it's easy as Americans to become very discouraged. It, it, it's easy to go, you know what? We've got too many issues. We've got too many problems. It's easy to want to give up. And I want to close with telling you a story about John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was the sixth president of the United States. He grew up during the revolution. His dad was John Adams. At eight years old, he was actually out performing musket drills with the Massachusetts Minutemen. I mean, this guy was really incredible. Um, he, he was a, a diplomat at the age of 11, a uh, U.S. diplomat. At the age of 14, he was a diplomat before uh, the throne of, of Catherine the Great in Russia. Uh, the, the, the guy was amazing. He was fluent in six languages by the age of like 14. It was unbelievable. But he became the sixth president of the United States. After he became the president, he then went back and he ran for Congress. He's the only president to go from the White House to Congress. Nobody else did that. But the reason he did it, he says there was one issue he wanted to see resolved. 
And he says, I wanna see slavery abolished in America. So he went back to Congress to try to overturn slavery in America. And, and, and when he went to Congress at the time, Congress was 80% pro-slavery. And when he gets there, he's up against 80% of people that don't believe in what he's doing and don't stand for what he stands for. And, and he was such an ardent fighter. They got, Congress got so frustrated, they made what was called the John Quincy Adams gag order. And what it was is they said that you are not allowed to talk about slavery from the floor of Congress anymore. You can talk about any issue you want, but not slavery. Well, one day he came with over 900 petitions to end slavery in America. Now you can imagine the frustration of people that are pro-slavery going, we don't wanna hear all this stuff. Well, he's in Congress for 17 years. He's been in now for eight or nine years going through this fight and a reporter came to him one day. And this reporter said, Mr. Adams, I, 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 I just wanna ask you a question. You've been fighting against slavery for so many years and you really haven't seen any visible signs of success. How in the world can you keep fighting when, when you're not seeing things turn around? What makes you keep going? How can you keep doing this? His response was brilliant. He said, well, that's simple. He said, because the duty is ours, the results are God's. The reason I can keep doing what I'm doing is because it's not up to me how it works out. It's up to me to do the right thing. And I know this is the right thing to do. We well, you know what's interesting is he, he, he served in Congress for 17 years, actually ended up dying in Congress, actually there in, in, in the Capitol building. But his last term, he, he, he was only in that last term for about a year and a half. There was a young freshman who was elected that last term. And, and as this young freshman came in, he began mentoring this freshman. And for whatever reason, he really liked this kid. Uh, being a president, he was a very popular guy. And lots of people wanted to buddy up with him, but he wasn't there to make friends. He was there to end slavery. So he really didn't care about making friends. For whatever reason, this young freshman, he was impressed with him. So he says, you know what? You, 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 you kind of come hang out with me. So for a year and a half, John Quincy Adams just kind of had a brain dump on this young freshman and said, here's what I think. Here's why I believe what I believe. This is why we have to see slavery abolished. This is the, the, the process I think we could abolish slavery in America. If I could ever get enough votes in Congress, we could do it. Well, he teaches this kid. And this kid gets so fired up. He's, he's so bought into this notion. Well, John Quincy Adams dies. And actually, because John Quincy Adams had been a president, because he'd been a diplomat, he served on five, or excuse me, four different presidential administrations. This guy really was a, a very famous guy. He could have had anybody be his pallbearer, but this young freshman ended up being one of his pallbearers. Really remarkable thing. Well, this young freshman was so inspired by John Quincy Adams. He says, you know what? I'm gonna get involved and I'm gonna make a difference. So after his first term in Congress, he ran for Congress again, but he got defeated. <laughs> He said, that's okay, I'm not stopping. I'm gonna run again. He ran again and he got defeated. He said, okay, I'll try the Senate. He ran for the Senate and he got defeated. He tried for local government. He got defeated. He tried for governor, got defeated. This kid was a born loser who did not win a single election again until he became the president of the United States. Here's what's amazing about this. John Quincy Adams devoted his life to ending slavery and he never saw slavery ended. But you never know who you might mentor in your life that might be the one to do what God's called you to do. John Quincy Adams mentored the guy. He never saw slavery ended, but he mentored the guy that ended slavery. This is what you gotta know. John Quincy Adams says, you know what? I'm gonna start doing the right thing. No matter what anybody else does, I'm doing the right thing. I'm leaving the results up to God. But here's parents, grandparents, but you gotta know. It might not be your generation when this thing gets turned around. But if you're willing to fight, you might train the generation that turns it around. You can't, you can't be overwhelmed and give up. The last statement I'm gonna give you comes from Lieutenant General Chesty Puller. He was a, a, a military leader. This guy was incredible. Um, he is the most decorated Marine in Marine Corps history. He was the only guy to ever receive five Navy crosses. I mean, the guy was amazing. Um, but when he was called in the Korean War conflict, the, the Americans were surrounded in Korea and many speculate they were outnumbered by as much as 29 to one completely surrounded. He gets there and he assesses the situation. This is what he said about what was going on. He said, well, we're surrounded. That simplifies our problem. Now we can shoot in any direction. His conclusion was, they can't get away from us now. Here's the reality. We gotta start changing the way we think as Christians. We cannot be defeated. We are not overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. Greater is he that's in me than he is in the world. We cannot have a defeated mentality, but we have to have a duty is ours, results are God mentality. As we look at our nation, you know, everything that's great about our nation came because of Christians and Christianity. The reason our nation's in trouble today is because there's a lack of Christians and Christianity. 
the challenge falls on us that we have to be the ones to turn this around. David mentioned that, that we are the light of the world. Well, we, we can't expect the world to turn on the light. It has to be Christians. We cannot expect the world to restore righteousness. It has to be God's children. We have to be the ones that get involved. We're the only ones that can. And, and as we've said all this, we have so much more. We are so excited to share tomorrow and Sunday morning and Sunday night. So much that, that we want to impart and give you information. One thing I do want to tell you about though. Uh, oh man, I don't know what that is. That's not what I wanted to tell you about. Um, we do have a website, wallbuilders.com. And on our website, we have all kinds of information where a lot of the, the documents I've showed you today are uploaded on our website that you can go and see them for yourself. That, that you don't need to take our word for it. Be a Berean. Go investigate for yourself. Discover truth for yourself. But we do have a lot of resources that we think could be very helpful to you. One of them is the Founder's Bible. The Founder's Bible is a standard Bible. It's NASB. But we were uh, approached a couple years ago and asked to do commentary. And, and so what we did is, for 26 years, we've been studying the Founding Fathers. We've been collecting their Christian writings and, their, and, 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 and what they said about the Bible and how the Bible shaped institutions and policies and, and civic groups. And so what we did is, as we went through the Bible, every time the Founding Fathers talked about how the Bible shaped an organization or an institution or culture, we just put what the Founding Fathers said about how the Bible shaped what they did. And so this is a really good way that, you know what, you do need to read the Bible, but this is a great way that you can read the Bible and see how the Bible shaped our nation so that you will know that, you know what, our nation really is a nation that was formed by Christians and because of Christianity, there's all kinds of other resources. And really, there's so much on our website, free stuff. So you, I, I'm not just trying to sell you something, but we really feel that God has called us to be an ammunition depot. We want to help equip you so that you know truth and then you can walk in truth for what God has called you to do so that we can make a difference in culture. The bottom line is, as Christians, it's time for us to start engaging and stepping up. But you cannot do that if you don't know the Bible. And as we know Bible, the thing that history shows us in early America is the reason our nation was so special is because we had Christians who knew the Bible and who did what God called them to do, and they made this a pretty special place. If we want to see our nation restored, it's going to be up to Christians getting in their Bible and doing what God has called them to do. Thank you guys so much. Amazing, right?